In this video, we'll be looking at the maths in A2 biology. So obviously, even if you're doing A2, uh, you will be tested on a lot of the AS stuff. So you will probably need to know all of the basics, uh, the ones that I've covered in the basics video, and also the ones I cover in the AS video. So make sure you revise for all of them and be prepared with uh, whatever it is that they might throw at you in exam. But here are some of the A2 ones. So first of all, let's look at respiratory quotient. So we say that we can use different uh, respiratory substrates uh, to do aerobic respiration. So it depends entirely what was available at that point. And the reason why we do the respiratory quotient calculation is to identify to see which substrate it is that is used in respiration. Um, specifically, uh, you might refer to this in chapter 18. The equation would be uh, RQ, respiratory quotient, equals the amount of carbon dioxide produced divided by the amount of oxygen produced. Um, another thing worth, notice, uh, worth noting would be try to avoid using the word amount in your actual answers. It's always better to be more specific, like saying the volume of carbon dioxide produced or the mass of whatever it is. So, but generally speaking, that's the idea. Now, you would need to also, apart from memorizing the equation, you will also need the number uh, for each of them. So for carbohydrate will be one, uh, the respiratory quotient will be one. And if you think about that, because we are producing six carbon dioxide here, uh, and then also using up six oxygen, if you just look at aerobic respiration equation. So it's quite easy to see that why that would be one. For proteins would be 0.9. Um, without going into details about exactly how proteins are broken down to release energy, let's just accept that it is 0.9. So that would, that would mean that we're either, we can't be releasing less carbon dioxide, but what might be happening is that we are using up more oxygen to actually do that process, so that's why it's lower than 1. Then lipids would be 0.7, and the key thing is kind of similar to proteins, but uh, you, you need to be slightly aware of this, um, is that lipids can undergo something called beta oxidation, or specifically the fatty acids do. And if they undergo beta oxidation, they would then turn all the fatty acids into uh, acetyl groups, which is the acyl coenzyme A that goes into the link reaction. And as the name implies, beta oxidation, oxidation means that it's using up oxygen to break the fatty acids down. So therefore, if this number is increasing further, then obviously the number uh, for the RQ value would go down even further down. So that's why it is not 0.7. So you can use this as a way to remember or understand why the RQ values are, are, the, are the way they are. The next bit will, about, uh, will be about finding the final quantity after n cycles of doubling. So what does that mean? So there are only two particular situations we'll look at. Number one is in chapter 21 when we are thinking about PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So PCR is an artificial way of replicating your DNA. So in, it's used widely in, for example, forensics. When you collected a small sample of DNA from, uh, let's say, blood samples, and you need to amplify that and make more of that DNA in, uh, in order to do um, detailed analysis later on. So you're trying to make multiple copies of DNA. And then in chapter 22, we would know about the standard growth curve, or we know that bacteria or microorganisms can grow exponentially. So um, we can use this particular equation to calculate the number of microorganisms after a certain amount of time. Um, so because we know that they divide by binary fission, meaning they double every single time by, um, by that method. So the equation that we have would be this one. So NF uh, simplify meaning the final quantity or final number equals the initial number, the original number, times 2 to the power of n. So n means uh, the number of cycles that the, uh, the initial quantity had undergone to become this value. So we can do a particular example here. So let's say you're given a thousand strands of DNA and uh, it's been put into the PCR of thermocycler machine for 30 minutes. Each cycle of the PCR takes two minutes, and then you need to now find the final number of the DNA strands. So this is quite a classic question, so let's just break it down first. Now, if we look at the original equation, we need to find that. 
and we've got that one, which is a thousand. The thing that we don't know is n, the number of cycles, which we can work out here. So it's been running, it was ran for a total of 30 minutes and each cycle takes two minutes. So the number of cycles really would be the total time divided by the time needed for each cycle. So in this case, two. So therefore I would know that n equals 15. So we have undergone 15 cycles of PCR. And then all that's left really is to put the numbers in. So nf equals n naught times two to the n. So therefore n naught, the original number is a thousand times two to the n, two to the 15th, uh, because it's 15 cycles. Then put the numbers into the calculator. Then we would arrive at three, two, seven, six, eight like that. And uh, sometimes in the question, they might say, present your answer in standard form. So we mentioned this in one of the previous videos. So the standard form would be, uh, we can just, we have to present it as the singular, basically single digit. So I have to start from that point onwards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 3.2768 times 10 to the seventh. Now, if, I, if the question says present it in standard form and also in two decimal places, then I have to simplify that to 3.26 or round it up, 8 times 10 to the 7. And that will be my final answer there. And that would be uh, calculating the final quantity after a certain number of cycles of doubling things by PCR or by binary fission. The next bit will be the chi-squared test, uh, in, and usually you find it in chapter 20, which is the inheritance chapter. This is again one of the other equations that will be given to you, the ones we just mentioned earlier, the respiratory quotient and also the uh, cycling one, you will have to memorize. But this one, any stats bit basically, they will give, it to, uh, give the equation to you. So the point of chi-square test is to find the significant difference between the observed and expected ratio of certain genotypes or phenotypes. Again, the word significant is important because it is indicating there is a factor causing the difference. In the case of chi-square test, the most commonly used thing here was about uh, identifying if linkage is happening. So I'll talk about a bit more about that later on. So we are saying that uh, because in genetics, you can probably sometimes predict what the expected ratio of genotypes would be. So if you're doing, and usually we get the expected one by doing a Punnett square. So for example, if you're doing a homozygous cross where you've got homozygous dominant crossing a homozygous recessive, then you know that they would be 100% um, heterozygous. Or if you're doing two heterozygous crossing each other, then you get 25% uh, homozygous dominant, 25% homozygous recessive, and 50% uh, heterozygous, which links to the next bit of uh, Hardy-Weinberg. But that's how we would work uh, our way through. But the thing is, in reality, fertilization is completely random. So we can't really tell if the actual frequency will be exactly the same. So sometimes we have to see if there is any significant difference there. So the equation is this chi squared equals to, again the sum of this whole bunch here. So F0 is the observed or the actual frequency uh, minus my expected frequency, the whole thing squared, divided by the expected frequency here. So if you add them all up, then you will get the chi squared value. Then the way you actually uh, analyze that is exactly the same as how you would analyze the t-test and the Spearman's rank. We look at the critical value at p equals 0.05. And again, uh, degrees of freedom n minus one. Then if it's, let's say chi squared is smaller than critical value at p equals 0.05, then we say that we are less than 95% sure that there is a significant, significant difference. And then if we're less than 95% sure, we accept the null hypothesis and we say that, okay, there is no uh, significant difference whatsoever. So we're saying that actually the observed frequency of the phenotype of the offspring is a close to what we're expected to see. So uh, we don't see anything different happening there. So that's absolutely normal. But if the chi-squared value is more than the critical value, then we are more than 95% confident that there is significant difference. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis, and then we say, okay, there is significant difference there. 
And usually this is when it becomes slightly different compared to the t-test. In the t-test, we just simply say, okay, they are different. And then, okay, so what? Then we find what the factor would be. But in the chi-squared test, the application of that in A2 will be saying, if there is a significant difference between the observed and expected ratios, that often links to say, okay, there is linkage of the genes occurring. So that means that both of each both of the genes that they were looking at, um, or the gene that they are looking at, is linked to something else on the same chromosome, so autosomal linkage, for example. So that is how we would use uh, the chi-squared value in terms of the conclusion. It's probably also worth noticing that uh, when we talk about frequency, uh, we're mainly talking about, let's say, the number of individuals um, of the offspring, for example, uh, and the observed and expected frequency. If you have to use percentage or anything else, just make sure in any situation really, no matter if it's chi-squared test or magnification or whatever, make sure that the unit that you're using should be the same uh, throughout. Um, so that to avoid any sort of confusion and they probably might want to try to trick you up by giving you a slightly different one for both of them. And finally we get to the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So this is basically the Hardy-Weinberg principle where we're saying that the genetic equilibrium is rather stable and the equation is used to find the proportion, so a percentage, or the number of individuals with a certain genotype. And actually if you find the proportion, let's say 25%, and you know the total uh, number of individuals, then you just do total number times the proportion percentage, then you find the number of individuals with a certain genotype. That's simply it. Um, again, it's given an exam, and technically speaking, there are two of them. And for those of you who do maths, then you probably recognize that this is a quadratic equation. And actually kind of resulted from, let's say, two heterozygous individuals crossing over. P squared usually stands for the homozygous dominant frequency. So the number of individuals that actually have the uh, homozygous dominant genotype. 2pq represents the heterozygous, and it would be 50% in this case. q squared would be about the 25% of homozygous recessive. And they all add up to 1 because we talk about 100% of the people that we're looking at, so it has to add up to 1. So that is the principle. And the other thing that to notice is also that P plus Q equals 1, because for one gene, we are looking at only two different alleles. So this basically applies to those uh, um, genes that only have two alleles and not the ones that have more than two. Okay, so just be aware. So we say P is the dominant allele frequency, whereas Q is the recessive allele frequency. So just to be careful about this, and we're just going to highlight this through. So usually, like I was saying, they will, you'll be given the recessive allele frequency, or the Q squared, which is the proportion or number of individuals with the recessive trait. So this is about the allele frequency, and this is about the phenotype, the actual trait that the people have got. Then you basically use the number there, and use this equation to work your way back to find P. So simply do 1 minus Q, and then you find p. So if it's q squared, just make sure you square root that first, and then 1 minus q squared square root, and you find p, which is the dominant allele frequency. And again, making sure that you know it's allele. Then using that, if you know the dominant allele frequency, you can work out the proportion or the number of people with uh, p squared or 2pq. So p squared, simply just square that number there, and then you can find the proportion, or, and then times it by the total number of people to find the in number of individuals or uh, do 2pq, so 2 times p times q, which is given in your question, uh, and then to work out the heterozygous proportion there. Or sometimes in certain questions they might say, can you find the uh, proportion of people that show the dominant trait? Now notice if they show the dominant trait, this includes both homozygous dominant and heterozygous. So just be very careful in seeing if they're looking for the genotype or the phenotype. If it's the phenotype, then you have to add both of these proportions up, so p squared plus 2pq, to find the number of people with the dominant trait, the dominant phenotype. The other types of questions that they might link to the calculation would be actually saying, uh, can you give, suggest one or two conditions needed for a stable genetic environment? So saying if there's no evolution happening. So uh, one example would be migration or mutation. If migration is happening, 
then that would disturb the equilibrium in that particular situation, then obviously that would not be a stable one. So you can't really apply this particular principle to it. And that links to saying, okay, whether evolution is happening or not. But the most of the time, they will probably do the uh, calculation and just make sure you know these two equations, which will be given to you in exam, and just work your way backward. Just be very careful not to get tripped up and uh, you know, distinguishing what is Q, what did they give you? Did they give you Q or Q squared or whatever it would be? So very quickly as a summary for this video, first of all, we've got the respiratory quotient value uh, in chapter 18 about respiration. So it's carbon dioxide produced divided by the oxygen consumed, and then you can work out the alkyl value, which is then used to identify which um, substrate it would be, would be used by that particular organism. Uh, just notice carbohydrate is one, proteins would be 0.9 and lipids would be 0.7 because it's using more oxygen for beta oxidation so therefore that number would be bigger, the whole number would be smaller. If you would like more information or more revision on respiration then feel free to go and check out the video and the playlist about uh, ch uh, on chapter 18. This side we will have the equation to calculate the final quantity of DNA or bacteria after a certain number of cycles of them actually doubling themselves. So the final quantity equals the initial quantity times two to the uh, number of cycles that they have undergone. In the questions, they probably will give you the time taken for, let's say, PCR, and then they say, okay, each cycle takes that much time, then you just have to use these two values to work uh, what is the number of cycles that uh, they have undergone, and then use that to use this equation then to actually calculate it. You would need to memorize both of these equations but they're relatively simple, so just make sure you learn them. And then the two equations that they will give you in the A2 exam would be the chi-square test, again, is a stats test to test for the significant difference between the observed and expected ratios of genotypes and phenotypes. That's the equation, the sum of um, observed phenotype minus um, expected phenotype whole thing squared divided by the expected phenotype. And then you compare it to the critical value at P equals 0.05, if it is smaller than that, then you're less than 95% confident that there is a significant difference, except in the hypothesis saying, okay, they're completely, there's no significant difference. So the observed offspring frequency is, a, is pretty much what we expected. If it is more than the critical value, then we say um, that we're more than 95% sure that they are significantly different. Then we say, okay, perhaps there is linkage happening that makes them uh, slightly different. On the other hand, we've got hardy weinberg equation, which is also in the same chapter uh, about inheritance, basically finding the proportion, so the percentage or the number of individuals with a particular genotype. So we can have P squared, which is uh, the homozygous dominant, plus 2PQ heterozygous plus Q squared homozygous recessive equals 1. And we also have P plus Q equals 1 as another uh, equation there. So you probably would need to use both of these equations to work out the proportions of different various different things. Just be careful about knowing what exactly they gave you in the exam. And there you have it, that's the uh, all of the maths in A2 biology.